Ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, speaking as a European and as a Norwegian, I would like to say that uh, I'm very glad to be in Ireland and Dublin. Uh, as a European, uh, it's important for me to be here now because uh, Ireland uh, has the EU presidency. And one of my priorities when I came to Strasbourg in 2009 was to do away with the competition that we had between the two organizations and enter into a close partnership. I will come back to that. And uh, speaking as a Norwegian, I have in mind what uh, Winston Churchill once said, that um, um, uh, the Irish are quite odd. They refuse to be English. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I'm coming from uh, many consider as a odd country because we didn't join the European Union. Uh, many in Norway say that we do not want to become a member of a club that wants to have us as a club. <laughs> <laughs> the quote uh, Grosjean Marx. Uh, but I'm think, uh, I, I think um, I, I feel really associated to, to Ireland. Uh, of course for historic reasons. But also uh, because of the fact that uh, we need uh, countries like Ireland and Norway in, uh, in Europe and others, of course, but also this small one and that, well, look to the Atlantic also, uh, because Europe uh, has to be united in diversity. That's what I believe in. I was strongly in favor of Norway uh, joining the European Union in 1994. But we lost that referendum and also the one we had in '72. So we have also lost two referenda. <laughs> uh, but uh, speaking about the Council of Europe, um, uh, as you know, it was started in 1949. It came as a consequence of the Second World War. Uh, and it was again, I think, Churchill who said that the peace in Europe had to be built on human rights and the rule of law because what we saw before the war was that where uh, rule of law ends, tyranny begins. So the peace had to be built on human rights and actually the European Convention on Human Rights is the only real uh, implementation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the world today. Because the European Convention is not only a convention, it is a convention system. Uh, consisting of many things, uh, the monitoring bodies we have, um, the assistance programs that the Council of Europe uh, has in order to help member states to make necessary reforms in order to comply with the convention standards. And of course, at the top of this system, we have the Court of Human Rights, which means today that nearly 800 million people in Europe can petition to this international court. It has never happened in history before. It does not exist on any other continent. And without the court, of course, the whole convention system would collapse. It would be another universal declaration of human rights, or a European declaration of human rights, but not a system of following up and getting the member states to implement and comply with the standards and values in the convention itself. Um, so I say this because there is a close link between the organization as a whole, the monitoring and the assistance programs we have, and the court. The court couldn't work without having the monitoring in the member states and and uh, if you look at the situation for, for the court uh, today, it becomes very visible. Because um, you have probably heard about the, the big backlog of the court. It's because so many petitions are coming, but they are coming from the member states, from the individuals in the member states. So it is not the, the court which is the problem. It is the situation in the member states. And that's why we have to concentrate on making reforms in the member countries 
so that not so many applications are coming to the court in Strasbourg. So the meaning of the convention system was not that the court in Strasbourg should take over jurisdiction from the member countries. It was the other way around, that the court was, um, um, that the judgment from the court should, so to say, push legislation in member countries in the direction of um, the standards in the convention. Uh, which has actually happened, but there is still a long way to go. Uh, and if you look at, at uh, the realities in Europe today, 70% of all the judgments from the court uh, relates to six countries. Of course, there are human rights and rule of, pro, uh, rule of law problems in all member countries, but uh, these figures show where the most heavy problems exist. And that's why we are focusing now on making reforms in uh, these countries, um, uh, which I will come a little bit back to. But uh, now, uh, so uh, when I came to Strasbourg in 2009, I saw a clear need for making a reform of the organization because we have been spreading on so many things. Now we have to concentrate on what I've said, namely concentrate over resources, over expertise, which is excellent. Uh, acknowledge all of the world and use them in the member countries to get them to make the necessary reforms. Uh, I will come back to where I think it's where we have to focus on reforms in member countries. And the second thing um, which I found in, uh, in particularly important was to uh, establish a close partnership with the European Union. There was a kind of culture of competition between the two organizations, which I said to all people in the house in Strasbourg, this has to be stopped. There is no way that we can compete with such an important organization. On the contrary, we have to, to work in close uh, partnership. Because Many things, and I think this was also uh, this message was also understood in Brussels uh, and, and recognized as important because the European Union have, has only 27 countries, we have 47. So it goes without saying that we have uh, influence in countries where European Union does not have uh, a legal. Um, right to, uh, to intervene, but we do have it. But on the other hand, we cannot do it without having the leverage of the European Union. Because, uh, for instance, uh, I mean, uh, in uh, countries like Euro uh, in, in um, uh, Ukraine and Turkey, it was, of course, very important that we have the legal instruments to intervene. And we, are, uh, we, we do it, and the same in Ukraine. But having the support from the European Union, because I want to come closer to the European Union, was very important uh, for us. And also, I mean, uh, the European Union also recognized that the EU key, a key does not cover all the issues that. Uh, uh, are mentioned or covered in the European Convention on Human Rights, and we saw that clearly when it comes to Hungary recently, when uh, we got uh, the, 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 the criticism against the new laws that would, were launched in Hungary uh, relating to the judiciary and the media sector. Um, the Commission also, of course, reacted very negatively to this, but they found out after some days that they didn't have any legal possibility to intervene because the uh, EU laws did not cover um, uh, these things in Hungary. But we overstand that the convention, of course, covers this. So therefore, the, European, the president of the European Commission, Barroso, said in the Europe, European Parliament, we have to pass this over to the Council of Europe. So, this is how we have to work together, realizing that we need each other, 
that we are covering different uh, geographical area and that uh, that uh, the acquis of EU does not necessarily correspond with the whole range of um, values and standards that are in the European Convention on Human Rights. And we are now working closer with European Union in many areas. Um, they are fin financing a lot of our activities and assistance programs that we have been talking about. Um, in Ukraine, for, for example, we have a broad reform prog program now for um, the judiciary. Uh, in uh, Turkey, we have had uh, close cooperation with the Turkish government uh, on changing the laws relating to freedom of expression, and in particular changing the mentality and the practice in the judiciary related to freedom of expression, which has now led to the so-called force reform package, which has passed in the Turkish parliament, and many say that the thousands of people will be released from the prison because of this reform package. This is a very concrete example on how we can change things on the ground. Uh, and of course, it, in that respect, it was also important for us to refer to the negotiations between Turkey and, uh, and uh, EU on EU accession. Now, what are the main human rights rule of law problems in Europe? I will not go into all the consequences of the austerity policies around Europe. But we can, I mean, everybody understands that it affects human rights. The fact that uh, I think 25 million young people are unemployed is a human rights uh, issue. But I, I do not want to go into that because we actually we do not have much impact on the economic policy uh, in member countries or at the European uh, level. Uh, so let me concentrate on where we can have real impact. And I, the first thing I would like to mention is um, the widespread corruption and misuse of power we can see many places in Europe today, unfortunately. I think it, it has always been there. I think it has been growing. Uh, and it has been more visible because of the transparency we are witnessing, uh, also because of the economic crisis. I mean, it has become visible in Greece. It was there, it has, but it has become visible because of the economic crisis. But I think this is a real threat to democracy in Europe because it undermines people's trust in political institutions. Now, what can we do? Uh, I do not want to mention specific countries, but I would like to say that, unfortunately, in some of the member countries, the situation is such that the judiciary is not entirely independent. Some places it is corrupted. Uh, the media is to a large extent controlled by economic or financial interests or oligarchs in some countries. Some countries, uh, the immunities in the parliament are too excessive so that People from the private sector, one can say, some places oligarchs, uh, get a seat in the parliament or buy a seat in the parliament in order to get impunity. So if you have that com combination, a parliament that is not, that is not autonomous, uh, but controlled by heavy financial economic interest. And the media are controlled also by the same circles. And the judiciary is not independent. Then you get corruption. Or let it put, put it like this, you cannot do away with corruption if this is the situation. 
and talking about stability in peace and peace in Europe, I would like to say this is a very, very serious matter. What happened in, uh, in, in South Mediterranean? They got the revolutions because of all the corrupted regimes there. At the end of the day, people will not tolerate it. It creates stability and even war. Now, how, what can we do? I think we, from our side, what we can do is to put emphasis on reforming the judiciary. To try to um, help building up an independent judiciary. That is about changing the laws. It is about uh, changing the practice, mentality in the judiciary, and of course, it is about also changing personalities there. It is a process that has to go over a long time, but it has to start, and we have started, as I, me I mentioned, one country. Uh, and I think it's the only way to get some countries out of the mess they are in to start to build up an independent judiciary. Without an independent judiciary, everything else goes wrong. And you cannot fight corruption if you don't have an independent judiciary. And of course, having free media, freedom of expression. That is equally important. And also to do away with the excessive immunities that exist in some parliaments. A parliament has to be able to control the executive and therefore has to be, um, in a way, uh, autonomous. Not, of course, detached from the executive power. I know that, but the parliament has to have the will and ability to control the executive power. So building institutions that are independent based on checks and balances and separation of power is still very important on the European continent. I think it's the most important issue for the Council of Europe being the guardian of human rights and the rule of law. The second um, thing I would like to mention is protection of minorities. It is the old problem on the European continent and it is still uh, important to have focus on this, uh, also in particular in times of economic crisis, uh, because again we see that minorities are under heavy pressure. They are the first to suffer from economic uh, problems, and in particular the Roma people. Roma people is the biggest minority in Europe, 12 million people discriminated against in all European countries, I would say. And in some countries, appalling discrimination, living under conditions that you could not believe before you have seen it with your, with your own eyes. So this is also a major concern for us and where we also are trying to uh, get more attention and put more emphasis uh, on. And in connection with that, the increasing intolerance, hate speech, even xenophobic tendencies and racism on the European continent. It is clearly on the rise again in Europe, and that's also something which we are keeping on our eyes on. And then you have some of the new challenges. Well, actually, it's not new, but they have become much more visible. Uh, and that's uh, violence against women and domestic violence. Here we have a convention, which is one of the newest, and I would say very important. Uh, and uh, quite many have, have already ratified this uh, uh, convention. We have abuse, abuse of children, which is another uh, uh, Human rights issue, uh, which uh, has to get more uh, attention. And there we have the so-called Lazarote Convention, which, has also become, which is also one of the new conventions uh, that are also open for accession from outside uh, or non-member countries. And, and, and also, of course, human trafficking. It's a huge problem on the European continent. And there we also have 
Uh, I think it's the only convention on the globe which is effective. We have a monitoring system connected to it, and it is also open for accession from outside uh, member countries. At the end, I would like to say a few words about a, another very important topic, because it is about, again, the partnership between EU and the Council of Europe. We, based on the uh, Lisbon Treaty, which is uh, legally binding for all the 27 member countries, we have started, we, uh, it, the negotiation started in uh, 2010, uh, about EU accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the negotiations have been very difficult, of course. It is not easy to bring in an organization with 27 member countries uh, in an organization that has uh, 47. So it has been difficult for EU, so to say, to define how they are going to act inside the organization and it has been difficult for those who are outside to find out how this will work out when EU, uh, mem uh, EU uh, will have a majority inside the organization. So this has been a, a difficult topic to try to um, find an ag agreement on, we, uh, both within the European Union and also between the non-EU countries and the EU uh, countries. But now we have an agreement on the table worked out by a uh, group of experts from all the 47 member countries and one from the Commission. And it means that we have crossed a very important point in the whole process because now this agreement, uh, which all the member countries have accepted, uh, goes to the European uh, Court of Justice in Luxembourg for an opinion. After that, it will come to the table of the European Council. And then we will see whether this enterprise have a real political backing so that we can move forward with it. Uh, and I mention this because it will be a major step forward for Europe if it happens, in many respects. Because if it doesn't happen, then we would continue to have a black hole in the whole human rights protection system in Europe because so many decisions are now taking, are being taken at the EU level. So without bringing those decisions under the same court as all other member countries in Europe, it would be a black hole. But if it happens, we will close this black hole. And more than that, can you imagine how uh, politically important it will be? And what kind of I think geopolitical implications it will have if all the 47, including the major powers on the European continent, the European Union as a, not only a European power, but also a global power, Russian Federation and Turkey are under the same, the same convention and the same court. I think it sent an enormous pos positive political signal to the entire Europe and also to the world. And by the way, since I am the chair of the committee that gave the Peace Prize to the European Union for very good reasons, uh, the fact that such a global power like European Union voluntarily says that we want to be under an international court is of historic dimensions. And it proves that the European Union is something different than other global powers in history. No global power has ever voluntarily said that we want to be under an international court. But this happens in Europe. So um, we have really created a culture of um, democracy and rule of law and human rights on this continent after the Second World War, which we need to safeguard. And as long as the European Union has only 27 members, we need the Council of Europe because we are stretching out to the whole continent and it is the only platform for uh, making one legal space for the whole continent, including the non-EU countries, big powers like Russia and Turkey. And we hope that Belarus will 
join us. I don't think in the near future, but we can look at the map and see clearly that Belarus belongs to Europe. And when that happens, the whole continent has been united under the same standards regarding rule of law, uh, human rights, and democratic principles. And it is an enormous achievement for this continent. Thank you. I'm looking forward to your <laughs>